If you came to New York this summer to see a Broadway play or a musical, chances are the one show you couldn't get tickets for was the Book of Mormon. And if you want to come and see it next summer, you would be well advised to book your reservations now. The new musical is from Trey Parker and Matt Stone, the creators of South Park, a show that changed the face of cable TV and is currently celebrating its 15th season. Now they're working their magic on the Great White Way with another outrageous satire. And it's not their first musical. The South Park movie included the Oscar-nominated song Blame Canada. Now they're the toast of Broadway. The story will continue in a moment. This has been the scene outside the Eugene O'Neill Theater since March, as people line up for the Book of Mormon, the hottest ticket on Broadway. It has already grossed $32 million, is sold out for the next five months, and probably will be for years to come. And that is music to the ears of its two creators, Trey Parker on the left, and Matt Stone on the right. Were you surprised it's been so successful? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we thought it was good. We really, we thought, you know, the songs were really good, and, um, but we didn't think it was going to be like this. Hello. My name is Elder Price. The musical is not just a satire of clean-cut, earnest Mormons with unorthodox beliefs. It's a playful send-up of all organized religion. Hello. My name is Elder Young. Hello. Did you know that Jesus lived here in the USA? It's the story of two mismatched missionaries played by Andrew Reynolds and Josh Gad who were sent off to Africa to proselytize to pagans who have heard similar spiels before with no meaningful results. In this part of Africa, we all have a saying. Whenever something bad happens, we just throw our hands to the sky and say, Has a diga Ibowa. Does it mean no worries for the rest of our days? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> We've had no rain in several days. Has a diga Ibowa. And 80% of us have AIDS. Has a diga Ibowa. Has a diga What the Mormons don't know, but soon will find out, is that the locals are flipping the finger at their Heavenly Father. If you the Heavenly Father? Holy moly, I said it like 13 times! It is rude, crude, lewd, and blasphemous, but it hasn't kept critics from proclaiming the Book of Mormon the best Broadway musical in a decade, or stop it from racking up nine Tony Awards. And for theater-going fans of Trey Parker and Matt Stone, it's exactly what they wanted and expected from the creators of South Park. A lot of the stuff, the uh, subject matter we've tackled, uh, the way we found ourselves there is simply by trying to do something that no one else has touched. And so we're just like, well, there's a reason why people haven't touched that. And we're like, oh, really? Because we want to go do jokes that other people haven't done, you know? Are there lines that you won't cross? No. no. I don't, yeah, we haven't found one yet. They're barely 40 and have already been collaborating for 20 years. They met in a film class at the University of Colorado and were partnered up to work on a project, quickly discovering that they shared a love of Monty Python and a subversive sense of humor. What were you like back then? Really cool. <laughs> it was just amazingly cool. Most popular guys at CU. Yeah. Do you remember what the attraction was? I just remember that our senses of humor were just so similar that we would just really crack each other up and, and it got to the, it got really annoying for everyone else in film school. Watch out for that bear trap. What? Ah! At ages 19 and 20, they raised $100,000 to make a movie about a Colorado prospector named Alfred Packer, who was forced to dine on his colleagues while snowbound in the mountains. That's all we're asking for. Cannibal, the musical, was rejected by the Sundance Film Festival, but Parker and Stone went anyway and held guerrilla screenings in a hotel conference room. Did the film get released? Mm-hmm. Sort of. Yeah, on video. What, I guess that's what you could call it, a release. I can, like, buy it on Amazon.com? Yeah, yeah, I bet you can. You might not want to pay more than a dollar for it, but <laughs> you may not like the price. <laughs> 
They moved to Hollywood and spent three whole years as starving young artists until a studio executive gave them $1,200 and asked them to make a video Christmas card that he could send to his friends. We went back to Colorado and we spent three or four weeks cutting out construction paper and we did this little thing called the Spirit of Christmas. Behold my glory. Holy it's Jesus! The primitive five-minute cartoon featured an epic battle between Jesus and Santa Claus over control of the holiday, as witnessed by a group of young boys that would eventually become the South Park Kids. Help me put an end to him once and for all. No, boys, help me. Stan, remember the choo-choo when you were three? I died for your sins, boys. Don't forget that. The video became an underground sensation. Bootleg copies circulated all over the country and ended up in the VCR machines of entertainment executives in L.A., New York, and London. That became so huge. I mean, it really was so viral before YouTube and all that. All of a sudden, people wanted to meet us more. And we got meetings everywhere all of a sudden. People were like, okay, what do you want to do? They eventually signed a contract to produce six episodes of a cartoon show based on the spirit of Christmas for a fledgling cable network called Comedy Central. The show was named South Park after a real place in a remote stretch of Colorado where Trey Parker says strange things always seem to happen. South Park was where everyone growing up, all the stories would come were like, oh, did you hear they found another UFO? There's been all these cattle mutilations. And it was like, where? South Park. Their version of South Park would become a creative Petri dish to examine and parody all the truly weird things going on in the adult world of America, as seen through the eyes of four elementary schoolboys who tried to make sense of it all. We used to talk about All in the Family, and we were big fans of All in the Family. And we were, in the time of the early 90s, we were kind of sitting there going, you know, a, a show like that couldn't be on the air right now. You couldn't do it because things are so PC. You couldn't have an Archie Bunker. And we used to talk about how you know, if Archie Bunker was eight years old, I bet you could do it. By the way, children, there's a walkout scheduled today to protest the war in Iraq. So uh, if you're against the war, run along outside. And if you're for the war, uh, stay here and we'll do math problems. A common device is to drop the kids in the middle of some explosive situation and surround them with extremes on all sides of an issue. Here you go, boys. These will help you protest. Tom Stoutzel, HBC News, can you tell me why you kids marched out of school today? Uh, more? Hey, all you un-American bastards! If you don't like America, why don't you get out? The show regularly takes on race and bigotry. Category is people who annoy you. Audience, keep quiet, please. Well, I know it, but I don't think I should say it. In this episode, one of the boy's father makes an embarrassing appearance on Wheel of Fortune. Huh? Oh. Ooh. Oh, naggers, of course. And then there was this on the financial crisis. How can I help you, young man? I got a hundred dollar check from my grandma, and my dad said I need to put it in the bank so it can grow over the years. Well, that's fantastic. A really smart decision, young man. We can put that check in a money market mutual fund. Then we'll reinvest the earnings into foreign currency accounts with compounding interest, and it's gone. Uh, what? It's gone. It's all gone. What's all gone? The money in your account. It didn't do too well. It's gone. What do you mean? I, I have a hundred dollars. Not anymore, you don't. Poof. It's worth reminding the uninitiated viewer that we're showing you sanitized scenes suitable for network television, not the cable, movie, or DVD versions in which the dialogue can be scatological as well as philosophical and every bit as profane as it is profound. But it is usually pitch perfect to anyone who has spent time around 10-year-olds aspiring to be adolescents. I'll bet if you've eavesdropped on a bunch of fourth graders today, the language would be pretty close to what you hear on South Park. I think we talked like this when I, when I was in fourth and fifth grade, you know? We, you learned those we bad did. words. We did, that was a con... I remember you know how to shut it off when the adults were around. Yeah. And it was like, let's have, let's <clears> do a show where kids talk the way kids talk. Right. Because at the time, we were, you know, just out of college, like, well, we remember, you know? And the, yeah, maybe and that's that really we were young was. enough to remember yeah. when we started. <laughs> we were now like, we're remembering, remembering. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about Parker and Stone is that over the past 15 years, they have written, directed, 
and voiced the major characters in every scene of more than 200 episodes of South Park. Then why did you lie about not seeing Clyde Frog the night he died? I know that I'm awesome and cool, Polly Prissy Pants. Their typical week begins on Thursday in this L.A. conference room with a blank storyboard and a brainstorming session that includes executive producer Ann Garofino and two staff writers. And you have like a typical, like, Cartman comes in. They have six days to deliver a completed episode to Comedy Central that will air the following Wednesday. Okay. All right. That usually involves five, ten to twelve hour days and one all-nighter. As soon as they have an idea for a scene, Parker will sit down and bang it out, then hand it off to the animators and, if necessary, to the lawyers. We have probably more freedom than anyone in television. We have for a long time. But we do still, at the end of the day, have, we have lawyers, we have legal. One of the touchiest episodes was about Scientology, a notoriously litigious group. Parker and Stone wanted to include a scene dealing with tabloid rumors that Tom Cruise, its most famous member, was secretly gay. And actually the joke was just, okay, we're going to have Tom Cruise show up and he's flamboyantly gay and whatever, like, yeah, but you can't say he's gay. And it's like, okay, but we can say he's, like, closeted gay. And like, no, you really can't say that either. And we're like, and then it just became this thing of, like, what if he's literally in a closet? And they're like, yeah, you can do that. Ah! Hey! Dad! Tom Cruise won't come out of the closet! Mr. Cruise? Mr. Cruise, come out of the closet! Tom, it's Nicole. You don't need to be in that closet anymore, Tom. Hey, Tom, it's John Travolta. Tom, you gotta come out of the closet. Oh, my God! Their politics are indecipherable, but tending towards libertarian. They don't carry water for anyone, don't do market research, and their only target audience is each other. If something makes them both laugh, it ends up in the show. So how do you describe this relationship? At this point, it's kind of like a marriage, you know, in, a, in, you know, in the way that we're just like, we've just been together so long. We spend so much time together. You can almost finish each other's sentences. And it's funny because we're just at that level now where it just doesn't happen anymore that one of us can say to the other, you know, one time I was doing this. <laughs> because it's like, yeah, I know, I was there. The foundation of the relationship is one of the strongest partnerships I've ever seen in any business. Anne Garofino and Scott Rudin know them as well as anyone and have been with them since the very beginning. Garofino is the executive producer of South Park and Rudin is the entertainment mogul who launched their film careers both produced the Broadway musical. Sometimes I've seen people try and triangulate one against the other, <laughs> you know. You see people work. try to get between them, they shut it down so fast, they, they have each other's backs in the absolute best possible way. And it doesn't mean they don't disagree, because they frequently disagree, mm -hmm. but they are genuinely a partnership. Garofino believes that Matt Stone is the more ruthless of the two when it comes to satire, and that Trey is softer with a sweet sense of humor that provides the charm. We wanted to know what they thought of that analysis. That Ann's pretty smart. Ann's a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> see, oh, see, that was the opposite. Right? That was really see, nice. That was, we're just proving the opposite. <laughs> Boy, that tray's ruthless. <laughs> Ann, she's fired. I believe that the Lord God created the universe. I believe that he sent his There's own no doubt that sharp teeth and a big heart are the foundation of their success and both qualities are evident in the Book of Mormon, which manages to ridicule the silliness of religious dogma while still being uplifting and pro-faith. And the Mormon just believes. Go to 60minutesovertime.com to see how Parker and Stone raced to complete a South Park episode in only one week. Sponsored by Lipitor.